Welcome back to the Mountain Morning Show's continuing live coverage of the Sundance Film Festival. Now, of course, we all know the importance that music plays in a film, and I'm thrilled to be joined with the group from the BMI Snowball Roundtable, BMI's VP of Film, TV, and Visual Media Relations, Doreen Ringer-Ross, and then composer Jeff Beal and director John Shank. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. Thanks for having so us. So first, for people who may not be familiar, talk to me about the role of BMI with Sundance in that partnership. Well, BMI, it, just so people know, is a performing rights organization, and we represent film composers and songwriters and music publishers and we go out and license the users of music who are primarily the broadcasters, radio, television, cable, internet, and through a very elaborate accounting and distribution system pay that back out to the creators of music or people like Jeff and other composers, songwriters, and music publishers. In the midst of that, there's this whole artist development level, this whole artist relations level that uh, people like me are involved in, where we are really concerned with doing artist development work for uh, the people we represent. So years ago, we got involved with the Sundance Institute because their mission statement was very akin to what I'm talking about when I say artist development. And in the 80s, we got involved in supporting their composer's lab. And when Peter Golub took it over, I think about 17 years ago now, we got involved as a, as a primary sponsor of that. And since it's my passion, I got deeply involved in helping form it. And it's just grown to be the most exquisite um, lab where, where composers and filmmakers actually work together, which is not anything that happens in film school or in film scoring programs. They, they never get that interaction. So um, that's sort of our pride and joy is our relationship with Sundance and the lab that we do. Jeff has been at the lab many times as an advisor and he's fabulous. And some of the composers that have gone through the lab are actually um, participating in this round table that we're doing tomorrow which is really t carrying the agenda of that lab forward into this festival where we, we support all of the composers that we have that have scored films that are in the festival that are at the festival. And we put them together and have this great conversation about that creative process. Because I often do panels that are called, you know, music the bastard child of post-production. <laughs> Can I say that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, it's sorry. It sounds good. <laughs> it's good, yeah. It's but it's there. true, because it's always that thing that's left at the end of production that runs out of mm -hmm. money that ends up um, being underfunded and nobody knows how to actually deal with it. So this is just one of those great opportunities where we get to address that, and Jeff's so great at it. Absolutely, and John, I want to turn to you quickly because I know that one of the most anticipated films at this year's festival was Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth sequel. Uh, you were, of course, the director of that of that piece, and I want to talk about your inspiration and what you were looking for in terms of the musical collaboration with the film. Well, this film, the sequel to An Inconvenient Truth, an inconvenient, inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power. Um, really is um, stands on the shoulder of the original film and what we were able to do 10 years later is tell the drama that's going on in the world between the vested interests and the kind of fossil fuel industry that want to keep you know business as usual and keep doing the stuff that got us into the mess that we're in in terms of the climate crisis and on the other hand the alternative energy sustainability revolution that's going on and there's just this incredible drama going on and of course our, our leading man Al Gore is navigating this world in just this incredibly dramatic way and the film as Jeff knows really has kind of you know, more of like a typical feature film like drama to it. It has incredible low lows where you're just looking at just the horrible stuff that's going on with the climate. You know, it's really just bleak and depressing mm -hmm. when, you look, when you go to the places in the world where you see evidence now of climate change. On the other hand, there's an incredible hope in the film with what very likely will become a, you know, a decision that we make as a global civilization to move towards a different way of powering our world and our economy. And so to work with Jeff is just sort of a dream come true because he is just a master at that whole range of emotion that happens in a film. And we really wanted an unusual score. We wanted a score that really help the audience feel the anxiety that is going on with mm -hmm. the climate crisis, but also lift them back up and help them understand that there's incredible hope as well. So. 
when we when when Jeff accepted our our request to work with him, it was just a dream come true. One of my favorite quotes is Han Christian Andersen's when he says, "When words fail, music speaks." Mm -hmm. And I think, especially with this climate change subject, sometimes words just seem to fail. How I'm going to say important uh, this yeah. topic yeah. is. Yeah. How did you? Uh, approach the inspiration for a project like this? Yeah, well, I do think you look for a way in. You know, you look for an emotional connection to an audience. That's why we put music in movies. And, uh, you know, it's funny, because I, I, I met, when I first met with John and his wife, Bonnie, who co-directed this movie, I mentioned another documentary I had here at the festival years ago, Blackfish, oh. <laughs> which had a huge effect. And that really made, made me an optimist about the power of film and the power of emoting in film. You know, there's, mm -hmm. some, there's a heartbreaking scene in that movie when a baby whale is taken away from his mother. Yes. And I always thought, maybe I went too far, but then when I realized how much that, uh, that film had an effect on people, like... It required like, that. Yeah, and, and, and similarly in our movie, there's some beautiful moments, you know, that one of my favorite favorite images and emotionally an emotion in the movie is when you know Al talks about this beautiful picture that he had in his office it was mm -hmm. the first photograph of the earth and I wrote this thing and it's funny my wife after she saw the screening uh, on Friday with me she said it's almost like he wrote a love song to the earth mm -hmm. and that's exactly what it is mm -hmm. you want to you want to get this sense of ownership of our planet that transcends politics that tends, transcends economics that's what motivates you to change and really make a, a decision that can actually move move things forward so you know, uh, I love what you said, though. That quote is beautiful. I, I think about it in my feature film work, too. Actors are fascinating to watch, and it's usually not what they're saying. It's what's happening that's nonverbal, that's sometimes the most powerful moments in a, in a film. Absolutely. And, Doreen, you touched on the fact that sometimes music and score can be an afterthought in mm -hmm. production. Well, clearly, it can be some of the most powerful parts of the picture. Uh, speaking to the roundtable discussion that you'll be having with the panel, what are some of the things that you discuss when you start the project, uh, you know, so the preemptive discussion rather than the post-production discussion? Well, the very thing that Jeff is talking about, we talk about the range of emotions. We talk about, I think, you know, it's, it's pretty typical, and we certainly did in this film, to talk about themes for characters. We had a leading man in this film. He had a theme that kind of evolves over the course of the film. It's, it's as important as the quote unquote screenplay, although there's not a screenplay in a documentary, there is a, there is a, a, a narrative arc of, of drama that occurs. And of course you have to, the music has to be in line with that. We, in, our, in Bonnie and my work, we've always been kind of on, on, on the sort of subtle end of storytelling. We don't like to beat people over the head and sometimes music can be bombastic. And there's a fine line where you don't want to you don't want to have the audience feel like they're being manipulated by the music, but right. you want to sort of dovetail with the emotion of the film so that it kind of enhances the experience for the audience almost at a subconscious level. And that's what Jeff and great composers do is they figure out a way kind of in almost like in a dreamlike way sort of, you know, to sort of get beyond the sort of conscious m mind into the subconscious and sort of help them feel the, the, the depth of the emotion that's going on on screen. I think also we try to unveil the communication process between composers and directors. Because mm -hmm. often at this festival you're dealing with films where you have first time filmmakers and you know trying to find that language um, is, is part of, of the foundation of that relationship. You want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost like, I, I describe it as a series of dates. You know, you're always on your best behavior in the first date. <laughs> sure. But I often tell young composers, it's that second date after you've sent maybe the, the filmmakers some music and they've had some comments, that's when you really get your hands dirty. Because it's not, being a good composer is not just about writing a good piece of music, it's being a collaborator. Sure. Right. So it's really listening to what the film is telling you, also listening to what they're telling you. And figuring out how to decipher, you know, um, often some of the best direction is not a director, you're usually better served if a director gives you adjectives as opposed to trying to tell you what to do musically. Okay. It's kind of the composer's job to take those adjectives, take those feelings, and to translate through them through their musical voice. And it's not a clean process. No. <laughs> Jeff might write a piece of music, we use it, it might, it might work for kind of a rough stage of the film, but as you go on and you realize how it connects to another scene in the film, you might have to throw that original piece away and write something that, you know, that connects to the, to the, to the new through line that we've developed in the editing process. And God knows editing documentaries is a very messy 
process yeah. you're kind of building the film in the edit room and so Jeff you know it, kind of the plastic way he's able to work with you know how about sort of throw stuff at the wall how about this how about that and then you sort of end, end up finding a road that works and you navigate down that well and I think so many people when they think of musical scores like you said some of those bombastic moments maybe the classic John Williams you know you can just identify it like that but some of the most powerful especially with documentaries you almost don't even hear it it just sort of sneaks in and you right. feel it as the film comes on and it matches so beautifully with what you're visually seeing on screen yeah. when you do the discussion with young composers what are some of the I, I don't want to say advice but but some of the points that you try and guide them in the right direction I personally tell them to be authentic. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that um, especially developing composers are always trying to be lovable, you know, and and be what's coveted. And so we'll all get these demos of here's my best version of John Williams, and that's so so not what people want. They're looking for original voices. There is only one John Williams, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of and imitations. Leave, but yes. but the point is, is you you need to find that voice as a composer, and you need. To, to learn to have the confidence to express it. At the same time, you need to listen to your director and be flexible and not precious mm -hmm. about what you've created in case it's really just not working as, as well as yeah. something else. I had a really kind of funny experience on this movie, which I hope to share at the panel tomorrow, because we had a wonderful editor on this film. And, and also what will happen is while they're making film, they'll put in what's called temporary music. And Don, he picked like the best, the best, you know, I've been around a while, you know, I've, I've been doing this for over 20 sure. years. This temp track was the most terrifying thing I've ever had because he had picked all of the best pieces from 20 years and I had to sort of figure <laughs> out I was competing yeah, with right. a younger version of myself. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And so I that you was had that, experience on your side. I <laughs> guess I did. Yeah, but you know, so but that's actually you what you do is you find ways to talk and one of the ways you do talk, like John said, you throw things up there and you and temp music's really right. useful because it gives you something to talk about. But Give then it can become a trap too cuz creatively it, it kind of limits where you, yeah. where you go yeah. with What's your the original idea. What's the original idea? What's the surprise? I'm really into surprises, you know. I, I come from a jazz background, and I love the idea of like not knowing what I'm going to do and really figuring out, let the film speak to me and figure out what that, that zone is. I think that's where the magic happens. You know, yeah. you can't plan it. It's, it's, it's a product of all, all of the things coming together. You know, I, I think one of the nice things about this movie, you know, John was also the cinematographer on it. And, and I think documentaries, you know, I've really come of age as mm -hmm. films. I think some of the most interesting filmmaking that's happening right now is in documentaries, and some of the. So I think music has sort of followed suit. We're sort of serving that that really more, much more sophisticated uh, way of storytelling that's, that's evolved. Yeah. And, and so in true. terms of talking to young composers, I think it's um, what's happened in feature films has happened also in documentaries, which is you have these kind of. Um, moments where a composer like John Williams will come along and, and everything will sound like him for the next 10 years <laughs> um, or, or longer. In documentary that happened with Philip Glass in the in the 80s and early 90s. Mm -hmm. he, he composed music for some very high profile documentaries and for a long time all documentaries sounded it had like to that. Be in that lane. And w that's why we were thrilled to work with Jeff and there's other there's other young composers out there that also have original voices. When you find something that doesn't sound like anything else but still works in this magnificent way and it's Surprising and allows you to, you know, sort of helps you feel this range of emotion. It's just a magical combination that it, it can't be beat. Well, this BMI panel sounds like it's going to be absolutely fascinating. How lucky for young people to be able to experience this and ask questions and find inspiration. Personally, I would just like to thank the two of you for creating the Inconvenient Truth sequel and getting that out there. I am very thrilled to have you all here and enjoy Sundance. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. you so much. All right, Thanks we're going to take us. a quick break here on the Mountain Morning Show. We'll be back with much more, including in the next hour, in the can, right after this.